CSF or cerebrospinal fluid is the clear colourless fluid that bathes your brain and spinal cord acting as a fluid layer for the protection of your central nervous system. It's produced by the four choroid plexuses located in your third, fourth and lateral ventricles in your brain. It's produced at a rate of approximately 0.3 mils per minute and a total volume of CSF is approximately 150 mils. That equates to approximately 10% of your intracranial volume or the volume inside your skull. There's around about 450 mils of CSF produced every day in a 24 hour period. So therefore, if you take 150, you can see that the total volume of CSF is replaced about three times a day. CSF is made from plasma filtration and subsequent secretion by the choroid plexuses. It's one of the three factors that determine your intracranial pressure, the other two being your brain tissue and your blood volume inside your skull vault. Whenever you have an increased intracranial pressure, CSF production remains relatively constant, however CSF absorption increases, thereby reducing the total CSF volume. CSF flows from the lateral ventricles into the foramen and monroe. From there it flows into the third ventricle and from there via the aqueduct of sylvius or the sylvian aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. It leaves the ventricular system via the midline foramen of Magendi and lateral foramen of Lushka, entering the subarachnoid spaces of the brain and the spinal cord. It is absorbed into the dural venous sinuses via the arachnoid villi and granulations that project into the dural sinuses. I'm going to put a picture at the end of this video to try to illustrate this concept better. Plasma constituents do not pass freely into the CSF and this phenomenon is known as the blood-brain barrier. There are anatomical and physiological factors involved in maintaining the blood-brain barrier. They are tight junctions at the fenestrated and choroidal capillaries within the brain, specialised bidirectional transport systems for ions, glucose and amino acids. If we were to make a comparison between the composition of CSF and plasma, you'd see that CSF proteins are about 1% that of plasmas, resulting in a reduced buffering capability of CSF. CSF calcium levels are about half that of plasma, CSF glucose levels are about 60% that of plasma, and that's why you should correlate it with a blood glucose level at the same time, and CSF chloride and magnesium levels are higher than that of plasma. It's also worth noting that CSF normally contains only a small number of cells, usually lymphocytes and monocytes. The total cell count should be less than five cells per millimeter cubed. So why do we take a sample of CSF? We can do loads of investigations on CSF to see different things. So whenever you're doing the lumbar puncture, you can see an opening pressure if you use a manometer. This is traditionally measured in centimeters of water and a normal value would be between 10 and 15 if you were lying down on your side, for example, and 20 to 30 if you were sitting up. This is elevated and raised intracranial pressure, so that's why this is a useful test. You look at the macroscopic appearance of the CSF and say there's any xanthochromia, which can be seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can look for the total and differential cell count if you send it away to the lab. You can do bacterial cultures and sensitivities on it to see what antibiotics, any bugs growing in it would be sensitive to. You can do protein and glucose levels. You can analyse immunoglobulins within it, and that's used to detect chronic CNS inflammatory conditions. You can also do cytology to look at the character of the cells, and we'll talk about these investigations and diagnoses in a minute. As we've already said, CSF normally contains a small number of cells, which are usually lymphocytes and monocytes, and the total cell count is less than 5 cells per millimetre cubed. An increase in cell count suggests either an infection of the CNS or a number of pathological CNS conditions. The differential cell count provides further information regarding the possible cause of any CNS disease present. If you've increased neutrophils, this may indicate a bacterial meningitis. Other causes of an increased neutrophil count would include cerebral abscess, seizures or CNS hemorrhage. If you have an increased lymphocyte count, this can indicate viral meningitis. Lymphocyte counts are also elevated in meningitis due to TB, syphilis, which would be tertiary syphilis if it was present in the brain, fungal and parasitic infections. Degenerative diseases of the CNS, such as multiple sclerosis, can also generate elevated lymphocyte counts. You can have a mixed reaction, which is increased lymphocytes and increased neutrophils, and that would be characteristic of a TB meningitis, fungal meningitis, and chronic bacterial meningitis. If you see an increase in plasma cells, this is also a feature of TB meningitis, just if you were answering any questions on this. 
You can also see leukemic cells, and that can obviously indicate meningeal infiltration by hematological malignancies, such as leukemia itself. Sometimes we go to great lengths to collect a sample of CSF, so it's important to know why. The biochemical analysis of CSF can be diagnostic in certain conditions, so if you've got an increase in CSF total protein, increased levels can be found in infection, blood contamination, and chronic inflammatory disorders of the central nervous system such as TB, syphilis and Guillain-Barre. You can also perform an electrophoresis study on your CSF sample. Electrophoretic separation of CSF proteins and detection of CSF immunoglobulin is important because CSF immunoglobulin can arise from three causes. It's either secondary to an increase in plasma immunoglobulin like in multiple myeloma or impairment of the blood-brain barrier where the proteins are actually able to cross the blood-brain barrier. It can also be caused by local synthesis in the central nervous system like in multiple sclerosis, where the increase of CSF immunoglobulin is characterized by an oligoclonal pattern of immunoglobulin synthesis, and this can be detected in up to 90% of patients with MS, so it's quite a good test, it's quite specific. You also test the CSF for glucose levels, so low levels of CSF glucose might suggest an infection, where the white cells metabolize the glucose, therefore it's low, or hypoglycemia itself, although CSF glucose is of limited diagnostic utility as the plasma glucose concentration must be known in order to interpret the CSF glucose properly. You remember we said that CSF glucose levels are about 60% that of plasma. Finally, you can do a polymerase chain reaction on the CSF or PCR. This is a technique to rapidly amplify a defined region of DNA or RNA. PCR has been used to detect the presence of bacterial pathogens such as syphilis and TB and also viral pathogens like HIV in the CSF. As promised, here's a better graphical interpretation of the flow of CSF in the brain. As always, there's lots more content on the website, propophology.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notifications button to find out when we're doing our next videos.